what shall we say at this uh, time. Well, by the time we finish, it will be uh, good evening uh, already. Welcome to this new edition of uh, the lecture series of Aula Mediterranea. This is a joint endeavor uh, led by EMET with a bunch of uh, teaching uh, and research institutes from uh, Barcelona or from Catalonia who are uh, working on international relations and other disciplines, but which all of them have in common that the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean area is central uh, to them. We are now in one of these lectures uh, from the international relations domain. That's why this one is organized jointly by uh, EMET and eBay. And today we have the opportunity to discuss and to debate about uh, the future of the Middle East in the next decade. Uh, what will happen, hope or disillusion, risks or opportunities, transformation or stagnation. For sure there will be change because there's always change, but in which direction? And in order, in order to try to grasp and imagine a bit what may be ahead of us, in the Middle East. Uh, we have with us uh, Florence Gaup. Uh, she is uh, an esteemed uh, colleague, someone with whom I had the pleasure and the opportunity to work with in several projects, a friend. Uh, uh, someone with whom we have we traveled <laughs> when we were allowed to, and also a great and inspiring speaker. So I'm sure that you will enjoy uh, this uh, this session. Uh, Florence, uh, she's now the deputy director at the European Union Institute for Security Studies. Uh, as I said, she's a, a Middle East uh, specialist, particularly on security, conflict, and peace, more conflict than peace perhaps, <laughs> dynamics uh, in the Middle East. She did her PhD, she found her PhD on the Lebanese uh, army. So she also is a, a very good specialist on, on, on the security apparatuses in the, in the Middle East and North Africa region and also security sector reform. Uh, she, as a foresighter, uh, she has produced uh, several reports on uh, tr trends and global trends in Europe, but also several of them, of those reports on the region we will be discussing today. And I invite you to, to look at, at two, at least two among the many uh, uh, reports, the Arab Futures Reports 1.0 and, and 2.0. She is also the editor for those that are more into podcasts than, uh, than reading, and I know many. <laughs> and, yeah, and I myself, I'm, I'm, I'm more and more into podcasts too. So she is also the editor of the What If series uh, of the EYSS. And I really encourage you also, if you, if you I either into foresight already or discovered that foresight is something you are interested in, I really invite you also to listen to, to those uh, conference. So I'm sure that we couldn't find someone better than uh, Florence to help us imagine what may be ahead of us, which are the things we should be uh, uh, looking at and we can still know not, I mean, and we are unable to see, we are unable to perceive. Uh, and as I said, I mean, the future is not written in stone. So we may move into very different directions. That's what Foresight is about, isn't it? So you may be able to tell us which are the alternative futures for the Middle East we have ahead of us and whether um, not only how this may also affect the European Union, I mean, the organization for which you, you work for, uh, but also whether there is any, we have any capacity also to move <laughs> the Middle East into, let's say, a preferable future. Mm -hmm. So Florence, all yours, you are in the driving seat now. Thank you, Edward, and thank you for your very kind words. Um, I think the audience should know that you've been a frequent co-pilot in all of these foresight endeavors about the Middle East, North Africa. So um, I think we, I'll bring you into the conversation at some point. Um, Whenever you want. <laughs> several times, I would say. 
whenever I want because uh, you have uh, uh, as much to say about this as I do. Um, perhaps I start with explaining how somebody working on the Middle East is interested in the future because it is a region that appears to be so unpredictable. And I think that's precisely the reason why we're interested in it, because we want to reduce the level of surprise and we want to increase the, the room for maneuvering where we can do mm -hmm. things uh, about the future. Now, um, if you take a step back and you're thinking in more general terms about what is the purpose of the future? Like why do humans have the capacity to think about the future? Well, it's because we want to do something about it. And this is where, you know, very often people say, you can't make predictions. Uh, well, it's not about predictions. It's not about, you know, my job is not to uh, say this and this will happen. My job is to help people that want to influence what's going to happen to make the right decisions. So this is very important because foresight is not prediction. It is thinking about what the future could bring and what we can do about it. So without action as a foresighter, you have kind of missed your target. It's not about being right. It's about influencing decisions. So um, we produced several reports at the UISS on, on the future of the Middle East and North Africa. And I'll run you some, through some of the main findings um, that came out of it. And we'll end on uh, what are the things that we don't know or were the greatest room for, well, it could go either way, either the good or the bad lies. So I cannot, as Edward said, the future is not set in stone. The future is what people will make of it. That's a quote from Back to the Future, by the way, a great philosopher, uh, the doc. Um, so we'll look at first, uh, I want to explain to you how is the future built? How is anything made really? Well, when you look ahead, then you have a certain cone. So the future will take place, but then you want to look at this frame. And this is actually a useful analogy to think that the future will not be everywhere. It will be in a certain frame. That frame is what defines the future. So for instance, things that we know or that we have high levels of certainty will still be here in 2030, will create the context, right? So the main challenge when you think about the future is to reduce the apparent infinity, right? So when you think about the future, you think, oh my God, there's so many options. How do I know which one to choose from? Well, the first step is to look at where is the frame? So where are the things, what are the things that we have high levels of certainty that will not change? And this is funny because people often skip that step. When they want to think about the future, they go straight to what will change, but it's equally important to think about what will not change. So for instance, we don't assume that by 2030, the entire region will be underwater, for instance. Uh, we don't assume that a large pandemic will kill half of the population. We don't assume that uh, they will run out of oil, for instance, right? So these are all things that restrict our vision of the future from the outset. So um, that's a tricky one because people sometimes think the future will be completely different from today, but it will have a lot of elements of today while still being different. So that's the, 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 the art of foresight is to find that right balance between the same and the difference. And then, so you have here the, 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 the frame, right? And then within that frame, you have certain things. Uh, imagine now that you're not seeing me in this kitchen in the countryside, um, but you're actually seeing some parts of the picture clearly and some parts of the picture less clearly. So the things that you see clearly in the picture are trends. So they're not there. There are things where that we can. So what is a trend? First of all, a trend is a pattern of change. So a trend indicates is in itself already an indication that something is evolving. So remember what I said earlier, you know, this frame is things that will not change. Well, a, a trend shows that something is changing. Something can change at different speeds, uh, something can change in a very disruptive way. And also a trend doesn't, you know, how do we interpret trends depends very much on what we know about it. And sometimes we think we have understood a trend 100% and then it turns out we were wrong. I'll give you one example. Um, in the early 80s, an American scientist was looking at the rate at the speed with which American women were entering the workforce. 
And he, so the trend went like this and he calculated if they continue doing that at that rate by 1990, we have no more women staying at home. Who's gonna take care of the children? Now, as we all know, this trend, women entering the workforce didn't continue like this. In fact, it went like this in the United States. So here's what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying about trends is that just because something has been going like this doesn't necessarily mean it will continue like that, but it still shows that there is a pattern of change at place. And so the first thing we're gonna look at is the things that we know will change and we're going to look at what we call mega trends. So mega trends are change, uh, tr trends that last several decades and that are, uh, require a lot of effort to be turned around. So that's why that we have high levels of certainty about them because they are so difficult to change, right? So they're not immune to change, but they're difficult to change. So that's why we have high levels of certainty about them. So, we have identified seven um, uh, mega trends concerning the region. Uh, again, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to bore you with all of them in detail, but let's just look at the most important one. I'll tell you all of them um, uh, beforehand. And then those that I skip uh, or I can, I can touch on only briefly, you can also read it up in the report. But so the seven trends that we have is, of course, climate change, um, urbanization, so the fact that people are moving more and more into cities. Um, demographic trends, so the population, you know, growth, um, dependency on food imports, number four, number five, digitalization, energy production, and geopolitical changes. So these are five substantial trends that mean that the Middle East, North Africa of 2030 will look different from 2010 or even 2020. Um, but what these trends then mean that we have to interpret together. So let's start with climate change. This is probably, uh, this is very interesting because we wouldn't have this conversation today in the same way, uh, like 10 years ago. Edward, if, we, if I remember correctly, 2013, that's not quite 10 years ago, but at the Euromascal conference, we were talking about of all kinds of stuff, but not really about climate change, if I remember correctly. So the sense of urgency, I'm not saying climate change didn't start then, but the sense of urgency, the awareness of this trend is really, let's say, three, four years old, especially in the region we're looking at. So this is a bit of a problem, why? Because this region, as you know, is already very hot and climate change means things will get hotter. And so I'm just gonna show you uh, here a graphic that shows you how much hotter this region will get, um, especially the cities. So you will see here, so on average, the, the region by 2030 will increase by one and a half to two degrees. So if you're talking 50 degrees in Baghdad and you have two degrees extra, that's already quite a lot. Plus the problem that we know that we see is that um, climate doesn't change um, in an even way. As you can see from this graphic, climate, um, climate change will affect some cities, some places a lot worse than others. So rather than having, you know, like butter on a toast, one or two degrees extra everywhere, you will have cities like Fez, for instance, which by 2050 will be almost eight degrees hotter, which is a, a really not a livable situation. You have cities like Oran on the very right end in, in Algeria, which will not be affected at all, really. Um, but the trend that we see is that most Arab cities will be affected. And as you can see, if nothing changes by more than two degrees, actually. So uh, the two degrees is for 2030. That means two things. We have climate change uh, in the region falling into two sections. First part is adaptation. So everything that's gonna happen by 2030, there are things we can no longer prevent. So we will feel the effects. And second part is mitigation. And this is about managing or reducing the effects between 2030 to 2050, ideally to zero, right? So it's these two things that we have to really um, uh, distinguish between each other. And I'm just gonna show you another visual. Um, the problem that, that we see is that awareness for this problem in the region is really quite low. So what I'm showing you at the moment is under the Paris Agreement, states were asked to uh, nationally determine their contributions on the reduction of CO2. And you see on the left column, everything that the states promised. And you will see that it's not that much. 
Um, so from the and and you will see that on the the, um, the red dot is conditional. So they're promising to do a lot under conditions that, and we listed them in the document, that they get support and financing from uh, outside actors. Um, two problems here. One is that um, if you're thinking the Middle East, North Africa isn't the big polluter, unfortunately, you're wrong because they're almost polluting as much now as Europe. Whereas Europe has been decreasing CO2 emissions since the 90s, this region has continued happily to increase CO2 emissions. So they have basically everything that we've lost, they made up for. And as you can see from this rate here, uh, their enthusiasm to curb emissions is very low. Good news here on the right. Well, actually good news, potential, let's say. Solar no, Hans, I, might, I might write and remember that you, I mean, it's exactly the same amount of uh, pollution, uh, of emissions, France and Saudi Arabia, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And that's a very yeah. telling example for exactly. people to Saudi realize. Arabia, and look at how little Saudi Arabia is contributing here under the Paris Agreement. Saudi Arabia is the eighth biggest polluter in the world. So that's, uh, that's not nothing. With less um, than 40 million inhabitants. With, with a very small population. And you can argue, you know, what, what do these CO2 emissions go to? Well, production of fuel, which is in itself a bigger problem. But we'll come back to the, to the energy protection. But yeah, you're right, Edward. Um, some good news here on the right. Now, this is a surprising one. Um, you would think that a region that has so much sun surely wants to move big time into solar energy. Well, today, I think not even 3%, pause for effect, 3% of the energy mix in the region comes from solar energy. Now, as you can see, uh, you have uh, three states that have declared targets. For, their, for, for energy coming from solar power. So you have Algeria, which very ambitiously, but this is very long term, wants to have a third um, of its energy from, uh, from solar power, Morocco 14% and Tunisia 19. None of the others. I mean, it's pretty insane, but that's good news because it means that the potential is very, very interesting. So this is uh, just the issue of climate change, but I think um, to, to start off with, it just shows you that this region has a very high level of threat and a very low level of response. And it has a high level of potential to, uh, to get uh, to drop its, uh, its own emissions and actually take advantage of the global shift away from fuel to renewable energy. Um, so Edward and I, we were talking about this. Do you remember Edward, this was the Arab Futures, the first report when you started talking about desert tech and this whole idea of um, uh, energy, renewable energy produced in uh, North Africa being imported to Europe. So at the moment we have a problem with storage and, tr uh, and uh, transfer, but once that problem is solved, the potential for this region is enormous. And we'll see with hydrogen no? now the, the issue that, every, that we were not discussing 10 years ago, but that exactly. it's being discussed at length now, it's green yeah. hydrogen. Yeah. Um, so what else, why else is this a problem, um, the um, climate change? So it's not just hot, it's not just bad for people, it's particularly bad for agriculture because in the region, so by the way, Edward, you mentioned earlier that I work on conflict. I'm actually moving away from conflict and I'm getting big time into climate now. We're currently working on a shadow paper called Arab Climate Futures. So we're looking at how prepared Arab states actually are and what they need to do to get ready for it. Um, and one of the things that we found, and it also actually hinted at already in the Arab Futures 2.0 report, is that climate change will particularly concern water. Uh, so you, you already have water shortages and you will have it even more. Now, why is that an issue? Because in the region, in contrast to Europe, for us, for us, most of the water production, uh, water usage goes into industries. In the region, it goes into agriculture. Um, you might remember that I said earlier, food import dependency is a mega trend in the region. Well, that means that, so that means basically that they don't, they can't produce enough to feed themselves. They have to import food from elsewhere. So the agriculture that they have, if it, if it becomes even less um, productive than it is, it will become even more of a problem in political and other terms. So uh, we do see, let me just pick out the number. Uh, some of the crops will be reduced by up to 30% in some areas, which of course will hit the poorest population the most. Um, 
So this is just one of the big trends. Um, we have the other trend that I mentioned earlier, urbanization, so uh, cities um, growing. So this is a global trend, right? So cities everywhere in the world continue to grow. Uh, you probably heard of all the mega cities, but actually it's not there that the growing takes place. It's more in the medium sized cities that it's taking place. But the problem is that in the region you have increasing slumification. So whole parts of town that become you know, really poor in terms of infrastructure that are totally vulnerable to any type of weather events. And as you know, climate change will lead to extreme weather events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have Cairo, of course, uh, we have parts of Beirut even, we have uh, parts of, uh, of Baghdad. So this is a real issue because here you have cities that should get ready for the future instead uh, becoming really inhabitable places. So um, this is, I think, something that we shouldn't underestimate, especially when we add the third mega trend, which is demographics. So you know, of course, you will remember from the Arab Spring, or maybe you heard about the Arab Spring, that this youth bulge, you know, this fact that a lot of people under 30 suddenly arrived on the labor market, didn't have jobs, um, were part of the problem that, uh, that emerged in 2011. Well, this is actually still a problem. So uh, between, uh, between now and 2030, the region will grow by 83 million new inhabitants. So 83 additional people that will arrive on the labor market at some point. So uh, of course, up, up uh, from 2050, this will slow down. So the region will stop exploding and then you know, become uh, move more into European demographic patterns. Lebanon, for instance, is already on the way there. Uh, so is Tunisia, but all the other states, uh, especially Egypt, uh, but Yemen also continue to grow at a pretty alarming rate. Um, here, I'll show you one, uh, one visual on, uh, on how this grows. So you can see here, um, uh, gray is what it used to be. Um, blue is between now and 2025. And then the dark blue, uh, turquoise, and the dark little arrow is long-term, so 2050 and beyond. So you do see that the, the, term, uh, the trend altogether is going down. So population is slowing down, uh, which is good news, um, but it's a problem in so far as that by the time, you know, the, the next 10 years, we will still deal with a high level um, of economic issues, especially for the youth, i.e. people under 30. The problem is that um, we, don't, uh, we don't see any development, we don't see any improvement in terms of youth unemployment in the region since the 1990s, basically. So 30% of the young people are unemployed pretty much all the time. And uh, that's a problem because people get really angry when they don't have a job. So this is the youth unemployment. Um, I mentioned uh, food import. Why is that an issue? Well, in 2011, um, actually in 2010, several things happened together that probably played a role in the Arab Spring. Um, we had a big wildfire, I think, in Russia and Ukraine, Edward. I'm not even sure, but it was one of the two or even the two. Both of them. Both of them, huh? And uh, so what happened was that they lost a lot of their uh, wheat production and what they had, they kept to themselves. And they are the two that export the most, especially to Egypt, but also to Algeria. And so in response, that led to an increase in food price. And so, especially bread. Um, so in the six months between the Arab Spring and the summer 2010, food prices tripled, um, par partly because of that. So food import dependency, I mean, now we are all aware of dependency, you know, um, supply chain dependency and things like that. And we realize that something that happens in another country can affect us uh, at home very uh, sensitively. So that the problem is that because the population is growing, because agriculture isn't uh, being very efficiently managed, but even if it was, it wouldn't solve the problem. Um, so these states have to import food. And now if you're thinking of the agricultural problem in the Middle East, North Africa, and you blow it up at the global level, you can imagine that a lot of states will have trouble with agricultural production, which means that these states continue to be vulnerable or rather their population will continue to be vulnerable. So um, there are other mega trends that I don't wanna uh, really go into now uh, because we don't have that much time. And I wanna talk more about the short-term trends Suffice it to say that, of course, the region is moving more and more online. 
So that's another mega trend, uh, but still not at a very fast rate. And uh, we, we think that it will be affected, we know it will be affected by uh, the global energy transition. Now, this is an interesting one because, again, I think we see a slight change ahead now um, um, in that some of the states in, in the UAE especially, but even Saudi Arabia are beginning to understand that their projection that they're going to be all producers way until 2050 and perhaps then the world will move, move away from oil might be wrong. And that's because Europe, so they have two main clients, Europe and Asia, and Europe, of course, is already moving away from oil, but now they're seeing that China is moving away from oil as well. So that could mean that the energy transition will happen faster. And for the states in the region, it means that they will lose a lot of their income. Now, um, remember I said earlier about solar energy, that could be an interesting market they could move into. The problem is that not all states in the region are capable of um, stomaching this type of change. So I'm thinking here in particular of Algeria, but also of Iraq and of Yemen, um, especially Iraq and Yemen, so stay, and Libya, of course, not to forget, uh, are states that are under severe internal distress, not to say con open conflict. So they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the, you know, any type of investment long-term thinking to prepare the energy transition. So my concern is that, you know, while they're fighting, they're really missing the train a much bigger uh, transition that will uh, that will affect them very much. Uh, before I forget it, uh, here's actually the the visual on uh, on the CO2 emissions. In case uh, you had any doubts, so this is already a bit older, but you can see that uh, they have reached European levels. Okay, so all of these are the mega trends, and you're like, okay, but what does that mean exactly? So when you think of the mega trends, as I said earlier, the mega trends is something that is quite big, that is decades long, uh, that is very difficult to change, right? So climate change, if we want to turn it around, all of us have to be on board and we have to, uh, you know, get our act together over several decades. So is that everything that makes the future? Of course not. So you also have shorter term trends. I like to call them catalysts. If you, if you paid attention in chemistry class, a catalyst is something that accelerates or decelerates other things. So these are shorter term trends that influence uh, the developments that will lead up to the future. And here um, we basically have uh, uh, the question, they are formulated as questions because they depend on us. This is why it's very interesting to see the future not as something that, you know, that I'm looking ahead and I'm saying, by the way, this is what's, what is in store for you, but no, these are the openings that I see and these are the obstacles that I see and the openings mean for you, you can take action and the obstacles are something you need to be worried about. So um, we formulated seven questions that will define what this future will actually look like. Remember, I said uh, climate change is about uh, in, to be divided in two parts, so adaptation and mitigation. So the first question, the first catalyst is related to climate change, but about the part between now and 2030, and is about how is climate change handled? Do, will they actually prepare for what's coming? So that's the, the other study I'm writing at the moment. The second question is, how will they manage urbanization? So there's nothing they can do about people arriving in the cities, but how are they managing it? Third is, Will they diversify their economies? Will they move away from uh, oil? Will they move away from the big industries, from the big infrastructure projects? I mean, tourism, for instance, at the moment has taken a real hit. Um, but, you know, tourism long term is not a, a sustainable uh, economic, well, I wouldn't say a sole economic source for the government. Like uh, Tunisia, for instance, I can't remember, is it 20% Edward? I think you might know better than me. In Tunisia, how much of the GDP, sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I know that GDP in Tunisia, uh, national GDP relies heavily on tourism. Yeah, I don't know. I know for instance, Egypt, it's a 10% approximately. So we could be uh, because of the diversification of industry of is being more, uh, which you are saying, yeah, sounds, sounds possible. Plus, yeah, let's say between 10 and 20 percent. So I don't know it for sure, but in any case, you know, I'm not just talking about pandemic. I can check. <laughs> yeah, why don't you Google it while I talk? Um, but the thing is that 
in terms of um, sustainability, you know, climate change will make the region so hot that tourists might not want to go anymore to Egypt. Like I know that Hogada, for instance, on the Red Sea, did a study and found out for itself that for all of August, it's just going to be too hot. Okay, so maybe people then will travel more to the region around Easter and not in the summer. But the thing is that climate change will affect tourism uh, as well. So economic diversification will be important, not just for the for the oil producing, producing states, but all of them. Um, then, of course, the issue of governance. So let's talk a bit more politics about regional relations, how they relate to each other. Uh, how the new generation of Arabs will see, you know, pretty much everything, their, their societies, their political systems and so forth. And lastly, but absolutely not leastly, how conflicts are solved or not. Um, and I just mentioned Yemen, I mentioned Libya, there's of course Syria, with every year that you lose uh, in solving a conflict, a very important development opportunity is missed. So I'll show you in a second also an interesting graphic on Yemen in that regard. So, um, I think we talked a lot about climate change. So I think this one, this one is obvious, but the point is simply that this is the biggest room for maneuvering, right? So when I said earlier, uh, awareness is rising. So yes, they left it a bit late, but it's not too late uh, because you know, there are measures you can take to uh, prove your cities, to prepare your societies, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, nine years is actually not, is not that uh, little. So here the states in the region can actually take measures and um, you know, we see it a little bit. We're starting to talk to NGOs in the region that are working a lot in, in climate uh, awareness and things like that. So I think actually I'm more optimistic now than I was two years ago on climate change. Um, we already mentioned also the cities. So um, unfortunately that's a big problem because uh, cities are beginning to become intertwined more and more also with crime, especially with drug trades, a uh, drug trade. Uh, so this one needs to be kept an eye on. Um, but let's move a bit into politics. Um, so as you all know, and if you don't, then you know now, uh, the Arab Spring was the result of several uh, economic and political issues. What you might not know is that absolutely nothing has changed in those issues. In fact, most of it has gotten worse. And what has gotten particularly worse, you know, the, the economy actually in some places, for instance, in Egypt has recovered, um, but corruption is still really bad. And so is uh, the rule of law. So I'm just citing a number here, according to the Freedom Index, Egypt ranks 156 and Saudi Arabia, 146. So just to give you a feeling, the total list of countries is 162, and Egypt and Saudi Arabia are basically in the lower 10%. Um, even lower are Syria, Yemen, Iraq. Okay, you, you could say, well, that's a conflict country. Uh, surely nobody expects anything in terms of human rights there. But the point is simply that in the region as a whole, we have a situation that is worse than it was in 2010. Now, if you're thinking, well, it's not so bad, you know, after all, everything is stable and people aren't demonstrating, well, then you're wrong. Because 2019 was the year when we had a second wave of Arab Spring. So we had Algeria, we had Iraq, uh, we had Lebanon, uh, people, and even in Egypt, you know, states that appear to be, you know, totalitarian almost, people still go and demonstrate all the time. And in Tunisia, you know, just a few weeks ago, COVID certainly has made a lot of people even more angry. So um, I'm saying that because I feel that some people in Europe think, you know, as long as they are keeping things stable, we're happy to work with dictators, except that they're not keeping things stable. And this is where we're going to move now to the, what I call um, the young Arabs, uh, the young, uh, the, the gen generation Z and young uh, and uh, the millenn millennials, they are the generation that are actually going to make uh, a big difference. Here I'm going to show you another graphic on people that have demonstrated, share of population that has demonstrated. So you can see that uh, there's a clear link here between age and unhappiness or, or rather willingness to demonstrate, right? So um, uh, anywhere below 30 or below 45, uh, you have a pretty consistent 10 to 20% of people that demonstrate. 
Uh, if you think that's actually not very much, uh, except for Algeria, which is very interesting, you can see that here all age groups uh, demonstrated. Um, that shows that the level of uh, obedience to the government is actually quite low at this point. And this is where I'm going to show you another graphic. This is where people sometimes think, um, sorry, here we go, obedience to authority. People actually don't understand that the Arabs bring kind of, you know, um, oh, let the genie out of the bottle. So even though it didn't result in full scale democracy, even though uh, it was met with violence in many places, it has actually, and you can see that in these graphics, it actually has created more disobedience because people have the experience and because they have seen that actually it can work. The Tunisia was a success. They removed the government. Egypt, you could argue, well, even though in, at the end of the day, they returned to a system that's not democratic, they still managed to get rid of Mubarak. So um, we do see uh, that, that this population, this youth population continues to think, number one, that uh, religion plays a too important role in politics and that thinks that democracy is actually the best form of government. So here you see a graphic on the role of religion and you see that the vast majority of people think that religion shouldn't play a role in politics. Now don't forget, this is the generation that produced the Islamic State. So uh, you, I would say that the Islamic State, uh, while being from the same generation, are an extreme uh, result of a certain processes but they don't speak for that generation. Uh, in fact, they are at, at the, the opposite end of that generation. So the question is for me, this is where the real you know, room for maneuvering will be, what would this generation do next? It is ultimately this generation that will define how le the leaders will change themselves, how they will adapt to the situation, how they will adapt to climate change, how they will manage urbanization, whether they bring the conflicts to an end, do they crack down on corruption, do they create jobs? Everything that relates to the future will be decided more or less at the political level, but it's the younger people that will give them reason to change or not. Um, so this is, I think, for me, the big question mark, um, what this generation will do. Before I come to an end, I just wanna show you the huge impact of war uh, on human development. So this is a, a calculation by UNDP on the war in Yemen. Um, basically with, with every, uh, so 2019, that would mean a five, four year war would lead to 21 year loss um, in, terms of, um, in terms of human development. Uh, next year, they will already have lost 26 years. And if the war continues all the way to 2030, they will be thrown back to the early 90s. So uh, I'm, I'm just saying that because I think people underestimate people who have never been in a conflict zone, underestimate the impact a war has on uh, human development and how long it will take to recover from it. So think Syria today, um, even if the Russians put all their money in it, Syria will be a, is a long, long, long way. Uh, it, I think it's already lost more than 30 years this was actually a few years ago that I heard that number. So we're already further than that in terms of development. Um, so you will sail into the future with a huge disparity between different states. Um, uh, so you will have the losers or the, you know, the ones that have, to, that have to really do some catching up, which are all the conflict states, uh, Libya, Yemen, and Syria. And I would say to some extent Iraq, because part of it was affected by the war against Islamic State, but also because it has uh, huge levels of terrorism and unrest all the time. So that's sad because it doesn't have to be that way. And I think this is the note uh, what I'd like to end on is that we talk about the region always like, you know, there's so many problems and we need to, um, you, know, you know, we don't know what else we can suggest because they just don't create jobs and they just don't crack down on corruption, et cetera, et cetera. But fact is, I see a lot of opportunity here. I think that the global move away from oil will actually create a different economic system that will make it a lot more difficult for governments uh, to be just in the hands of a few. I think that digitalization has very interesting uh, potential for, for citizens in the region, be it in terms of uh, control of corruption. There was one study done on the port, um, this port in the Iraqi port in the south, I forgot the name now. 
not Basra, but right next to it, they digitalized customs. And guess what? Corruption, um, well, no, corruption decreased. We know that because the, in, the, the port income, I think, increased by nine times. Yeah, so digitalization made it a lot harder for people to pocket money. And therefore, digitalization could be a very interesting avenue forward in the fight against corruption. So, um, I mean, as I would, my, my final balance assessment would be, I really hope that nine years from now, when we talk about where the region is today, that they use this really difficult situation. But the fact that there's, they're meeting this difficult situation at a point in time when different historical developments that have nothing to do with them, you know, be it climate change, digitalization, demographics, et cetera, actually give them some keys in the hand to open, to unlock a completely different door and a completely different future. So the way ahead, it depends on them. Great, thanks Florence. I told you it, it was to be inspiring. It was inspiring because we've seen these drivers for change that can move into very different futures. So some of the elements that Florence identified certainly brings us closer to a conflict-ridden uh, Middle East, the lack to uh, adapt to climate change, the uh, issue also of food insecurity, uh, violence in, in cities, increased inequalities, uh, so many, many elements that in the next decade, in a way, could lead us towards uh, more conflict, more violence, more instability, less opportunities for the people from the region. But also, uh, and Florence uh, was keen uh, to insist on that, a uh, huge margin to do things differently, and the new energies also that the young population may bring. So now I would like also to bring our young population too. So our colleagues, students and friends that may uh, would like also to raise questions on the chat. We have already some comments that perhaps while well, people start thinking about the questions that they would like to, to pose you. But we have here two, two questions in fact. Huh? I know, sorry, one is you. <laughs> so it's, it's the one on, on, on migration. But uh, Dario was mentioning this issue of, of brain drain, hmm? the, which makes us think also about the patterns of mobility. Huh? In, in, on the one hand, you've insisted on this internal mobility, so rural exodus to these middle-sized or the mega cities in the region. But we also see how some of those drivers for positive change that may be the better train uh, and more innovative segments of the youth may uh, also be dispersed and they may also be attracted uh, by other uh, job markets. Uh, and not necessarily in Europe, it could be in the US, in Canada, uh, elsewhere. So that's also an, an element that I don't know if you want to, to, to comment as you were also mentioning the issue of mobility because we haven't talked much about mobility. If you want to, to tell us, I mean, how do you see the patterns also of uh, uh, migration, refugees, internally displaced people, but also transcontinental uh, migration uh, evolving in the next decade? And while you uh, comment on this, we wait for our colleagues also to, to join us with more questions or more comments. Pause. So migration is an interesting one because um, it's very difficult to make very certain uh, statements about the future of migration. And the reason is simply that the larger the component, the human component in the trend, the more difficult it is to predict because humans are so are the, the, the trickiest element in foresight. Um, so what we know is that uh, uh, migration has many different sources. Um, it's a combination of people uh, wanting to leave and being able to leave. So um, it's contrast to what many people think. It's not poverty that pushes people into migration, but it's actually people that are at the upper end uh, of the lower middle of the lower classes, or you know that have a level of education already and so forth. So. It's a bit of a spontaneous uh, misreading 
to think, yeah, the more poorer people are, the, le- the more they want to leave. No, because in order to be able to leave, you need to have a certain level of education, you need to have a certain level of money, and you need to have a certain, um, uh, how do I put this, self-assurance that you know where you're going will be better. So uh, the, that's what we know that about you know, the profile. So um, about, I think 60% of uh, forecasts of migration turn out to be right. So that's pretty 50-50. But let's just say that what we know is that from the surveys, we know that a lot of young Arabs want to emigrate. They want to leave, um, which makes sense because a lot of them actually have a decent level of education, depending on country. But you know, Tunisia, for instance, or Algeria, Uh, If you have the baccalaureate, you will want to go to France, for instance, or maybe Germany. Um, But the problem is that it's difficult for them to leave. Sometimes it's a combination. So it's a combination of of funds and it's a combination of the receiving countries, not just allowing them to, to, you know, you can't just emigrate to Germany just like that. Um, So what we suppose is that there's a big pool of people that want to leave, but at the moment that haven't left, uh, because it's, they, they are not at the level to cross the Mediterranean in a dinghy, but the legal way to just fly there and then p- find a job there has not been open to them. So um, my guess is we will not see a migration crisis as in 2015, uh, you know, with like waves of people arriving, you know, a million people arriving in one country at the same time. But I think that overall the pressure on Europe will incre- increase, yeah, because depending on how the situation evolves there, because people leave when they feel there's no hope that nothing here is going to get better. I might as well try elsewhere. And um, this is where, you know, this is a catalyst because we don't really know in which direction it will go. It's up to the states in the region and to the decision makers in the region to um, come up with with a vision that encourages people to stay. I think this is something people underestimate. It's it's not just about jobs. It's about hope. It's about the feeling that where I am, it's gonna get better. And this is, I think, a very uh, interesting human trait that very often we are happier thinking things will get better than we are with things that are very good, right? So it's, it's a relative thing. It's a optimism about the future is something that humans really care about. And this is, by the way, Edward, I looked at the statistics on this. Um, Mm. People are the most optimistic when they come out of a very difficult situation. So After COVID, then. Exactly. So we're all going to feel really good about in six months or so. Um, But that's also why Europeans, when you look at European statistics on pessimism, optimism, Europeans are notoriously pessimistic. But that's not, it doesn't mean that they're unhappy. It just means actually that they're happy, that nothing is really bad. So what could get better? So Mm -hmm. there's like a sense of flatness. So I think what people in the region need is a sense of hope, a sense that something will get better. And at the moment, I have to say, the decision makers are not exactly inspiring hope. We have already some new questions. I'm gonna put them one by one more or less. Uh, Michaela uh, is asking uh, about specifically about how do you collect sources, how you find sources, for instance, in the case of, of energy and pollution. I would add to Michaela's question, I mean, and, and how reliable they are and how trustful those sources may be when trying to project uh, futures. And she added a second question on this, which was about renewables, about solar energy, uh, asking whether it is too expensive. It's still too expensive to be developed as you are now also moving your expertise from uh, wars to weather. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on the sources, sorry, I'm just trying to dig up a scenario for you that I have here. Um, on the sources, a lot of, uh, so you're right that sources need to be questioned. And so for instance, to give you an example of um, one source where we felt this makes no sense, or this is just not a very, interesting statement is it's not related to the future but it's related to the police you wanted to find out how for a different study how police and people were actually um, working together and so what you get in terms of official data is two sources one uh, the official data that the states gave to the united give to the united nations on crime 
And then the surveys that ask people, how much do you trust the police? We find that both are not exactly, um, I'm not gonna say trustworthy because they are not, they're not lying, but do that give us the full picture? Um, for instance, on crime, when a state reports a crime, well, they're only reporting the crimes that were reported to them, right? Mm -hmm. So all the crimes that are not being reported because people are scared of the police or because they're ashamed, for instance, rape is one of the most underreported crimes. Um, so uh, that means that we don't get the full picture. Same goes for trust. Does trust tell me whether you will actually go to the police if you need their help? It just means that in that instant, you know, maybe you were scared to say what you really think in that context. So the survey uh, doesn't capture how you really feel. But there's a way around that. So for instance, um, in Iraq, we have extremely interesting uh, victimization surveys. So a victimization survey is a survey that asks people, how have you been the victim of a crime in the last six months or the last year, for instance? And if you answer yes, um, then they will ask you, uh, did you go to the police? Uh, did you, uh, would you go to the police? Uh, when are you the most afraid of being the victim of a crime, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is a bit of a long uh, turnaround to answer your question fully, but this is what you, as a researcher, you need to always ask yourself when you're looking at data, what is this data actually telling me and what am I actually looking at? And the same goes for all these, um, these data, this data that I use here. So when we're looking at the future, obviously uh, half, of the, half of the problem is that it hasn't happened yet. So I cannot, I cannot make an assessment on something that hasn't happened yet. So I have to look at what I know and then the rest I have to fill in with different possibilities. So we looked at the different uh, Yemen scenarios, for instance, we're looking at extrapolations when it comes to, um, for instance, uh, um, demographics, right? We're looking at a longer term trend. Um, we're looking at, um, let me just give you an example of energy, the energy transition, because, the en and then lastly, when we really don't know, this is where we play with scenarios. Here, we, here it comes. Um, so this is a, from a, a very interesting report on the geopolitics of energy transition. So these are not my scenarios, they were published in Nature. So here you have three ways that the energy transition can go. And this is one of the ways that you manage the future in terms of foresight. When you don't know, remember I said earlier, imagine that there are parts of the picture you can see, but there are also parts of the picture you cannot see. And these parts, you, will, uh, you can use scenarios to imagine what they could look like. So this, for instance, these are three scenarios for how the energy transition could go. Now, um, the point of scenarios is not to say which one is the most likely, but to think through which would be the implications of which one, and can we establish signposts, can we establish criteria to see this one, this one, or this one is now actually unfolding. Right? So it's like you're developing a blueprint, and then when you see events unfolding, you will be able to spot early on which mm. one of the three is it actually. So for me, scenarios are really quite a good way around the fact that you will never have data for everything. You will never have data uh, to answer all the questions, but you have creativity. And this is why, Edward, you know, I always say this, that so foresight is more art than science. There's a lot of elements here that are scientific, especially our methodology because we don't just go and invent scenarios, we have a method for it. But when we really have not enough data to go on, we use scenarios. Mm -hmm. We have another question by Carlos Masax, and he is asking about uh, the Chinese influence in, in the Middle East. Uh, particularly, he mentions the Belt and Road uh, Initiative and trying to understand how much what we will see in the Middle East in the next years will depend on the plans, the strategies for the future that China may have. And we may broaden the, the, this question. So it's not only about China, it's also about the other powerful external actors, China, I China, Russia, India, still the US, but also even the, the weight that Africa will have in the future that may also affect also the Middle East position in uh, global affairs, but also even internal dynamics in the Middle East. So how to factor in all these uh, either global or external factors that could move 
the futures of the Middle East into one direction or another. It's an interesting question because I, I skipped the part on geopolitical change and how it will affect the region. But of course, that's exactly the, the question we were looking at. The role of China, the role of the United States, the role of Europe, and, and also the role of the region itself. Because, you know, we have states now like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, but also others that are, you know, that have the ambition to play a role beyond their own borders. So the role of China is one of the big question marks. So we don't know where it will go. Uh, you probably saw that the Chinese foreign minister was just in Saudi Arabia um, doing a bit of a tour of the region, etc. And everybody got quite worried, you know, what are the Chinese now coming big time to the Middle East, North Africa? At the moment, we don't see that happening yet. We certainly see a Chinese interest, of course. Um, we see a lot of uh, agreements on more economic cooperation, etc., etc., but um, that was me, it was Karen Young, actually, Edward, who you know well, who said, follow the money. As long as this money actually hasn't, you know, led any to anything, this is just words. And just words mean nothing. So at the moment, we don't see a deepening of this relationship. But the question then for a good foresighter is, under what conditions could we see a change? So we always thought that with the... Um, that the impetus for change would be the energy transition. We always thought that the Arab states would turn to uh, China to continue producing and exporting oil. But now we see that China is actually moving in the same direction as Europe. So this one is out of the window. The second thing, so therefore, that we could consider for a deepening is um, if um, the United States really turns away completely from its allies in the region, so I'm thinking here, especially Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and that would make them feel vulnerable, perhaps, and then could, could perhaps lead them to, to get closer to China. Um, we also always think that um, the fact that China isn't so annoying on human rights as the Europeans are, that that could make them interesting. My personal feeling is, though, that while there will probably be more co economic cooperation, Politically speaking, the Arab states are not yet convinced that China is going to be as important as the United States. So they're still playing the, the Russia, Europe, United States classical game, looking at China potentially, but definitely not there yet. We have uh, another question by Albert Vidal on, on jobs. Hmm? about which kind of uh, brighter futures we could imagine when it comes to this big challenge that you mentioned about unemployment, but also uh, the informal economy, uh, the reliance also on tourism and industry that has been severely hit. Is there a possibility for a reindustrialization process in, in the Middle East and North Africa or in the Arab region? So what we think has a lot of potential is artificial intelligence and robotics, not to uh, replace Arab labor, but to make it more efficient. So especially in Egypt, but also you know, in the Gulf states, this has huge potential. Then of course, uh, the renewable energy sector, everything related to the environment could be very interesting. Uh, I would say that also more generally, um, I, I'm not going to say industrial basis, because I think that actually, if you want to really think long term, then the region has to get ready for full, full scale knowledge uh, economy, and also even circular economy, and that they are not doing yet, uh, very far away from it. So there needs to be a change in educational policies as well. Um, the regional states are broadly aware that they need to change, but that's still in the making. But I would say that the potential is there. You know, there's proximity to Europe. There is, you know, there is digital, there is uh, solar energy. There is, as I said, a lot of potential, but I feel at the moment they're still clinging to the older model. Maybe it's an age thing of the leaders, but I feel that they haven't quite arrived in 2021 yet. Mm -hmm. Another very interesting question by Edward, Dario. Yeah, there's also, exactly, I was going to say there's also two questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dario asks, uh, uh, says, despite these troubling trends which affect all of these states in the region, they will not affect all of them equally, isn't it? 
Can you tell us which states do you consider to be the most prepared or resilient to these trends or to navigate change and those that are least prepared? Uh, so also, let me also add to Darío's question, another one that they had in mind. In which uh, territories or areas from the region could you imagine positive change happening, which would have a regional effect? So who, that a uh, change whose effects would transcend the borders of that particular country and become a region-wide transformational process. And this could be for the better or for the worse. So I would say that the most, that in all the, the, these, these points I made earlier about you know, the big question marks on how states are managing this and this and this and this, I would say across the board, the leading state is the United Arab Emirates, um, because you know obviously they have advantages. They they have oil and they're small and you know et cetera, et cetera. But still, without being cynic, you can see that the leaders in the UAE actually have, um, I think, taken seriously the challenges of the future, especially the UAE. Saudi Arabia is a bit behind it, trying to. Do the same thing on a much larger scale but i think the uae is really trying to build itself as a state not just ready for the future but in fact symbolizing the future in the region um i, I wanted to go but then the pandemic happened but and visit the new uh, museum of the future then they have the expo 2020 which is going to take place later this year um what else is there they have master city you know this model city um to test out co2 neutral building of cities, then they're flying to the moon, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, all things considered, um, including the vision of hope that they're giving to their population, I would say the UAE is well placed to uh, weather um, the climate change, uh, not climate change number one, but also the, geo, the, the energy transition um, in the region. Leading in, in uh, renewable energy is, of course, Morocco, but the UAE, UAE are not far behind, so they're well on track. Um, so I would say, you know, all of the Gulf states in general, because they have resources, they're better prepared. Saudi Arabia is, is better prepared than Algeria, for instance, uh, because of, a, you know, for a number of reasons. So one state that surprised me, I have to admit, uh, we looked at the climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies is actually Egypt. And I didn't expect that because quite frankly, Egypt is not doing so well on most other reform agendas, but at least on paper, they have the most convincing strategy to mitigate the effects of climate change, sorry, to adapt to the effects of climate change and actually also to mitigate them. So mm -hmm. I'm going to put a question mark here on, well, they have the strategy, but will they implement it? But at least they have a strategy and they have the best strategy in the region. So I'm going to say Egypt, if they play their cards right, actually doing better than I thought they were going to be. And then uh, in the middle, somehow, where is uh, Algeria? Uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Lebanon, they all have the potential to do much better than they're doing. But they're being, they're being embroiled with a lot of internal turmoil and um, lack of long-term vision. So I would say that they are going to be, especially Algeria, they're not ready. You know, if we all pull the plug on oil uh, very soon, then Algeria is going to be in severe trouble. Mm -hmm. Who's going to be hit the hardest, of course, are the conflict countries. So uh, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and to some extent Iraq. Uh, are not fit for the future at the moment. But the good news is there's still some time. So it's not, they're not doomed. There's still, there's still a lot of catching up to do. So, you know, I've always had a soft spot for Iraq. I always think, come on, you have the potential, you have all the resources, just, you know, pull your socks up. So I hope that Iraq in particular will, will, will turn things around. With the help of the Pope. <laughs> Spraying for them. Uh, Vitas uh, asks uh, you about this uh, famous second wave of the Arab Spring, a second wave that, by the way, in a different form you imagined in one of your reports, but that one was one of the what ifs, and it was because of a football match, huh? Mosala, yes. 
I remember. But yes, I mean, we've had an, a second episode of uh, social and political contestation in 2019. And Vitas asks if you see this second wave having any real changing effect on the political and social makeup of the countries of the region in the coming years. And uh, which countries seem like they are moving towards the type of society that these new generations, Z and millennials want? I mean, who is listening to the youth uh, more carefully and has the capacities to deliver? So um, I think it would be easy to just dismiss the second wave because it hasn't been as dramatic as the first one. Um, I think certainly the most disappointment is in Algeria, where considering what the Algerians did, they got very little in return. It's still a level of change. For the moment. For the moment. Um, but I think that it's just simply too soon to tell because I think, don't underestimate the impact that these demonstrations have on the mindset of decision makers. So I think that the Algerian government, those that are now in government, who got into government because of the demonstration, they are very concerned that this will happen again. So the lesson that the Algerians taught them was that um, we will not be scared by, by the police because they went on the streets anyway. So I think that the Algerian change will be more subtle and more slow and more behind the scenes, but I still think there will be a degree of change. Um, Lebanon, I think, again, is way too soon to tell. At the moment, it's still ongoing. And, you know, we're now in the second year. Uh, they continue to demonstrate. They continue to riot. Uh, the economy is in tatters. Uh, the government simply refusing to make any changes. So I'm afraid that Lebanon will have to go through a lot more pain before the change will be there. But the point here is that the people have not given up. You know, there still are demonstrations almost every week in Lebanon. So we're not, you know, it's not like a wave, like, and it's over. It's more like a long drawn out movement. And lastly, I think the most successful is Iraq, has been Iraq, because the the movement against the government has produced changes, even though, okay, it hasn't been the big revolution and uh, end of this of uh, sectarianism and what have you, but you have a prime minister now that is really taking that seriously. You have um, them taking, making real changes in terms of, for instance, electricity provision, uh, environmental concerns, you know, this is why they were on the street. So it's easy to dismiss that because it's not the big democratic um, revolution, but what they were uh, annoyed about, or more than annoyed about, is that in Basra they were uh, running out of electricity at 55 degrees Celsius and, uh, and drinkable and water. And drinkable water. So this is a good reason to get really annoyed. And this is uh, a large part of the population that dem not just demonstrate, but basically besieged the green zone and said, guys, you have to change things. And they are changing things. Is it the big revolutionary change that perhaps some people want? No, but again, not yet. As I said, don't underestimate what this experience will do to the government. So I think we're still in the throes of the second wave. Um, and I think there will be more, uh, more things to come. I mean, don't forget Tunisia also has demonstrations all the time because of youth unemployment. So in that sense, I think every leader in the region now knows that the street is there to be reckoned with, um, which, I think sooner or later, this is where I'm an optimist, but sooner or later it will lead to the necessary changes. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one more question also on, 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 on the Gulf and migration, and, but we can open up to the effects of COVID. Huh? How COVID has somehow disrupted some of the pre-existing trends. Huh? COVID was I mean, not a full surprise, but we couldn't imagine this happening right in 2020, but certainly has it's been a, a big disruptive uh, uh, factor. Uh, here Dario is mentioning the issue of uh, reverse migration. So people leaving the Gulf, probably to come back, uh, forcedly or voluntarily to Southeast or East Asia, or I guess also to Ethiopia and other countries. What do you you think in that respect? I mean, do you think that this is this, some of these changes that COVID has provided are there to stay, including that one from migration? But feel free also to add uh, other uh, changes that you have identified as a result of the pandemic. 
how much have they disrupted the scenarios you had in mind? So I think, you know, um, about COVID, we were talking for a long time, uh, well, basically from the beginning of COVID until now, we have been thinking about how disruptive is COVID and to what sector, right? And I think that um, certain sectors, especially labor, uh, will be affected in an irre irreversible way. Um, from, you know, I'm just talking about where I'm working. Um, we have gone from being in the office being the norm. Now we're not allowed to go to the office. Surely afterwards, we will retain some flexibility. And I think that's for all the knowledge workers. Um, but then there are those uh, workers that do not have the option to work from home. So either they cannot work from home and they have to go to work or they lost their job, full stop. So some of the, so here there is no real movement because those that, let's say restaurant workers, that they will just go back to work. So I think for instance, that um, it's, the, it's the experience. So trying something new that will establish itself more than something that just fell off the radar. I'm, I'm not sure I'm making myself clear, but I'll try again. So basically now we've all worked from home. We're used to online conferences, et cetera. So all of us, I think we're like 25% in Europe. I think it's a bit lesser in, in the region. Uh, for, for these 25%, things will have changed forever. Will restaurants uh, disappear forever? Personally, I don't think so. And therefore these jobs will not be lost forever. They will come back because I think that people will continue to love eating outside. Um, and then you have those jobs where working from home will never be an option, like being a doctor or a nurse or a fireman. So what I'm trying to say in a very convoluted fashion is that uh, where we tried and tested new things, change will remain permanent, will be permanent. But where we actually just stopped doing what we did before, I think change will not be permanent. So in other words, I see a degree of uh, a change. So let's say a 25% change uh, in the economy, in the established, in the advanced economies, uh, but not the, the vast majority, right? So we will see certain pushes forward, but I would say the majority of economies will remain the same. However, um, I think where the impact of the Gulf economies is the strongest is the low oil price. And this is where, you know, they have been, they have been struggling even before COVID and they have these very ambitious plans. And of course, you know, social spending went up after 2011. So they, they, they're maneuvering a very difficult ship at the moment. But I think that it will not fundamentally change, at least for now, their economic structure, not yet. But I think that ultimately that will happen sometime after 2030 with actually even before, because the push begins now towards climate change, AI, digital, et cetera. Um, so I think COVID gave some part of the economy a push, but not, not all of it. You are muted, Dan. Sorry, uh, I have a, key, uh, a question from Alexander on a question you know really well, uh, a country you know really well, which is Lebanon. And he asks you uh, if there is a way out <laughs> to the current crisis in, in, in Lebanon and, and what this way out could be. And he asks, uh, which is the role that external actors, including the European Union has, uh, in, in helping the Lebanese find a way out. And if you want next to this question, uh, you may also, I mean, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is where do you see the EU having the greatest leverage when uh, uh, helping uh, these positive changes happening? Where, where I mean, a, a union like European Union with limited resources still and limited also political will where they should be putting their eggs uh, in which basket when it comes to the to the Middle East and North Africa. So you know it's funny um, I had a fight with my boyfriend the other night over Lebanon. Because we are we are doing... live huh? be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he also knows Lebanon very well uh, because we couldn't agree on what's going to happen. So I'm just saying that because, you know, even people uh, that work a lot or that look a lot at the country uh, aren't fortune tellers. And I think they should candidly say so when they just don't know. So I was on the, when I was actually in Lebanon when the, when the revolution, the uprising demonstrations, no matter what you want to call it. We were started. together. Exactly. So were you. <laughs> Um, and I thought at the time, 
this is not going to change anything fundamentally unless I hear people asking for a change of the system. And you will remember Edward at the time, even though they were chanting Thaura Thaura revolution, they were not actually making demands for a different political system. I think that's where the problem is at the moment. The political system of Lebanon encourages politicians to feel unaccountable towards the Lebanese as a whole and only accountable to their sect. Um, and, and then there is this, you know, established system of families and, you know, long-standing. It's almost like power in Lebanon is inherited from father to son um, eternally, basically. And, and I always thought that the minute that system is changed, so Taif is changed, or people ask for Taif to be reviewed, then the way will be freed for actual fundamental change. Now, so far, I have not heard anybody call for a review of Taif. Um, I also see, however, that the government is playing completely deaf to both the demands of the international community and the demands of the people. And so in my book, this will go wrong eventually. Um, but eventually the question is when and what do you mean by going wrong? I, I thought, well, people will get so angry that maybe they start, you know, burning down houses of rich people and, uh, you know, putting fire to the yachts in the marina. But it almost know. happened in Tripoli. Exactly. In, so, in Tripoli, there were some incidents of this kind. Yeah. So this is where, you know, you can look at history and history can, can be a source not to teach you about what will happen in Lebanon, but an indication for how people deal with a situation like this. What do human beings do? And I read something uh, quite interesting uh, last year by Stefan Zweig on inflation, how in Austria they lived through inflation and how horrible it was. Really, infl inflation is so much worse than anything I thought uh, it could be because it really breaks your trust in the system. Your money, one day you wake up and it's worth nothing. And the Lebanese are, are living through that at the moment. So I think they are suffering much, much more than people think. My conclusion would be that eventually they will do something along those lines, and i.e. something more extreme, be it in terms of violence or asking for a more fundamental change of the political system, which then I think actually would not be a bad thing, because I think that this political system, even though it worked as long as it did, ultimately produces chronic elements that aren't good for Lebanon. Now, what can the EU do? Um, this is interesting because uh, France has tried to, to, well, to help Lebanon and put conditions to it, saying, you know, this is about the financial side, not about the political demands of the protesters. And the Lebanese just refuse, you know, so this is about the, the, the debt and, and all this banking stuff. And they just refuse because they, the government thinks we can just sit this one out and we just refuse to admit that we're poorer than we thought we are. Um, so what can the EU do? The answer is, as long as Lebanon doesn't want the EU to do anything, the EU cannot do anything. Um, this is, I think, an interesting one because um, I think there's uh, in Europe sometimes this tendency to overestimate how much influence we have. We don't have that much influence. In Lebanon, if the Lebanese as a whole in the government don't want to change, there will be no change. And that's the reality of it. So now I don't see any more questions, but in fact, we've reached uh, but you asked me you asked me a question I haven't answered. If you want, I can answer that. Where we should put our eggs in which basket. Ah, yes, go ahead. Yes, I thought that you did not want to answer that one. No, I'm happy to answer it because this is exactly what I've been thinking about, right? Uh, Edward, you remember when we started uh, our work on this, we kept saying youth unemployment is the big thing. And then mm -hmm. I would say, you know, people say, oh, nothing happens. Actually, it's not true because to keep youth unemployment at the level it is, while the population is growing, something has happened to keep it just where it was. It's just that they didn't manage to decrease it. So the options that I've been looking at, what can we do? I think number one, climate change, climate diplomacy. So help the Arab states to get ready for, uh, for climate change to mitigate the effects. I think that's actually great for all sides concerned and there's even nothing people can be upset about. I think it's not even ideological like human rights. So climate change, climate mitigation, climate adaptation is the first thing. It's even something that we are quite good at. I think the EU has learned a lot in the last uh, 30 years about 
uh, climate change that it can pass on and then you know help support the states. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is the energy transition. I mean, it, you know, it's a pipe dream. Desert Tech was a pipe dream to be laughed at uh, 30, 20 years ago, but now actually maybe not that model, maybe not the pipelines under the sea, but the model of energy from the Middle East, North Africa being, well, firstly used by them, but then they have so, they would have so much, it would be enough for us and them. Uh, that's again, good for both sides. So I think uh, energy and climate previously considered, you know, a bit like the things that nobody really cares about in terms of relations between the EU and Southern neighbors, I think these are the two areas where we can actually do a lot together and we don't have to wait for you know, any big democratic change. Any government will be happy, I think, to get on board for that. They are kind of the Cinderella of the future yes, exactly. of, the, of the Middle East. Just let, let me, as I, we have still two or three minutes, I think. One thing that I uh, had in mind when listening to you, which is, and this is increasingly common, in two hours, we haven't mentioned Palestine at all. Hmm? Uh, in the past, it would have been unthinkable to discuss either about the present of, or the future of the Middle East or the Arab region without discussing about the Arab-Israeli conflict, about the Palestinian question. Do you think that it really lost gravity in the in the Middle East, that the center of the discussion is elsewhere, that it doesn't have this potential to be the trigger either for good or or for bad, or just that we are not looking at it enough, and that we may be escaping and missing some of these weak signals the, from from Palestine. Then one day we will wake up and say, "Hey, how come we forgot?" about what was going on in, in, in Palestine? I think, so the, the Abraham Accords, um, I think did change the dynamic uh, in the sense that, so in my opinion, so some people put it as the big peace treaty and you know suddenly the Israelis are being integrated in the region, isn't this great, etc. I think, even though as Europeans, we're not happy about the accords, um, not because we don't want Israel to have good relations with its neighbors, but we think that um, ultimately the Palestinian problem needs to be solved and then everything will clear the way. That's how we as Europeans always thought about it. But then the Israelis always said, um, we can't give the Palestinians a state because we're in a super hostile neighborhood and then we'll be encircled by even more enemies. The Palestinians. So what I'm thinking now is that with the with the deal between the UAE uh, and the others and and Israel, that now Israel can no longer make that argument. So I'm wondering, you know, we're perhaps not in a in a position now where the United States will make a big initiative on uh, on Palestine. Maybe not now, but I think it changes the conversation in that sense, because Israel can no longer claim that this is the reason why it won't give away the Palestinian territories. So what I do hope is that ultimately the Palestinian state is still the end of the journey for this conflict, because I don't see any, any, it can go any other way. And of course, now you know this as much as I do, Edward. Now what we are all wondering is, can the Saudis push the Israelis into that direction? Because if the Israelis have a peace deal with, or diplomatic relations rather, with Saudi Arabia, that would, you know, that would crown its integration into the region. And if anybody now has the political capital to convince Israel that, you know, you want relations with me, well then give the state to the Palestinians, it's Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't think this is gonna happen anytime soon. I think Saudi Arabia would be also very cautious and say, you know, uh, we don't want to, we, Saudi Arabia would have to be very careful not to create domestic problems for itself, because I think that Arabs overall, and not just Arabs, I think Muslims in general, still care very much about uh, the, play, the fight, the fight, the plight of the Palestinians, and, uh, and don't like the idea that the government is just striking a deal with Israel and nothing else will come of it. So I think probably that's what's happening at the moment, is that the Saudis are trying to figure out, can they convince their domestic population that 
this is a good thing for Saudi Arabia and that it's a good thing for the Palestinians. So I would say the ball is in the court of Saudi Arabia and I hope they pick it up. Thank you, Florence. So uh, now, yes, we reached our final destination. Uh, it's eight o'clock and uh, it's time to go prepare meals and everything else that you may have to do at home in your nice French countryside that uh, we see in Florence uh, image. And uh, thanking Florence, I mean, for this inspiring uh, presentation and, and, and conversation we have had also with our audience, very active with uh, comments and, and questions. And thanking again, uh, EMET and eBay for organizing this session. And hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you, I take care.